Hello everyone. I hope you are having a great Thursday and I certainly am because I am in with another interview another interview as you can see in that I am having a conversation with someone who is a public speaking expert. He is inspiring leader, award winning speaker, a coach, author, master class coordinator and most importantly he is the second place winner in the 2017 world champion of public speaking yes you guessed it right no points for guessing it is simon bucknell simon thank you so much for agreeing to do this uh welcome to this interview oh, absolute pleasure great to be here Haritos. yeah you have been really really gracious with all the time changes that i uh proposed and all the things so really really thank you for that now uh, i know a bit about your journey and some of the people who are watching or who will watch know but I would like to hear from you. How did it all started in terms of your public speaking journey and what all kind of things you have done? Well, for me, it, it, like so many people, I think uh, public speaking started off as something that I found difficult. It was never something I hated. Some people, of course, do really, really hate the thought of ever standing up. And I've done a little bit of drama, a little bit of debating at school and at university. But um, but I, I never pursued it that seriously. And then in my first job, a couple of things happened that were really important. The first was I made a mess of a, my first phone call in my first job. I, instead of saying, hello, John, have I caught you at a convenient moment? I said, hello, James, where have you caught yourself? Uh, just through the sheer anxiety and stress of getting it wrong. Um, so that was, a, that was a bit of a wake up call. And then at my leaving drinks from that job uh, back in May 2001, I... I I hadn't realized I might have to give a speech, but I was asked to and and I had a complete panic and my face went red and my heart was pounding and all those sort of classic symptoms of panic, really. And, and I now realize, of course, it's actually adrenaline. But it was a really, really horrible experience for me, even though I was with colleagues, I was with you know, people that I'd been working with for a couple of years. And it was I remember very, very clearly saying to myself, this is this is awful, that there must be a way to get better at this. There must be a way to improve. And and so sure enough, uh, I, I, I did a bit of research and I found a public speaking club. And that's how I joined a Toastmasters club. Uh, I, I spent a bit of time away. So I, when I returned to London, I joined a Toastmasters club in 2004. And for me, that's where my public speaking journey really started. Amazing, amazing. And I would love to hear about your journey to the World Championship of Public Speaking 2017. So how did all that happen? Yeah, well, it wasn't something I planned. Let's put it that way. One of the best decisions I made very early in just the first few months of my, my being a member of the, the the Toastmasters Club that I mentioned, it's called uh, well, London Corinthians and then London Cardinals in those very early months of, of 2004, was to go to the, uh, as it was then, the District 71 Conference, which was the Britain and Ireland Conference. And at that event, I got to see, I just literally booked it sort of three days notice. I'd never been to Ireland before. I got possibly the last b and b slot in limerick over in the west of <laughs> ireland i can still remember staying with mrs birmingham who kindly um made a room available for me anyways <laughs> but i went to the conference and i'd never been to anything like that before and i saw all these speakers light up the stage and they weren't celebrities uh, they weren't you know they hadn't scaled everest or been prime ministers or whatever and I, it was a real eye-opener for me and i and of course, central to that was my experience of being an audience member for the mm -hmm. speech contest, the winner of which, Eric Rainey that year, went on to represent Britain and Ireland in the in the World Championship semi-finals over in the US. And I just thought, wow, that's it's just really inspiring for me to see perfectly ordinary people who had really developed some skills and achieved big impact with audiences. So, uh, so that was in 2004. And then it wasn't until uh, probably a year or two later, I think it was 2006, that I'd been a member of a club then for a couple of years and I decided to enter the competition and I thought, wouldn't it be great to do well at club level? And my speech, it, it just kept winning. And so yeah, that's that's how it came about, really. And I ended up competing in Washington, D.C. in the nice. in the world semifinals of 2006. Amazing, amazing. And I do follow your post on LinkedIn. I, and those are some and, and people who do not follow Simon, please go ahead and follow he posts every day some amazing posts, some amazing, amazing <laughs> videos, some amazing insight. So what I want you to actually talk about is, and one of the very amusing posts that I found was something related to the dress code that you 
uh, posted about on the dress code on the world championship stage uh, so what is that story all about very funny one yeah that yeah that that, that's true. that was one of my big lessons so so i first competed at world level in 2006 in washington i was in the semis i didn't get through to the world final the following year went through to the semis again into in phoenix arizona came second in the world semi just fit, missed the world final and it wasn't until a number of years later that I finally made it into the final in Vancouver in 2017. <laughs> and a uh, wonderful experience just to even be in the final, to be honest, because you've got anyone in Toastmasters who's been to the convention will know you've got an audience of about two and a half thousand people and a big yeah. live stream. It, historically, in the world final, the, it had typically been run in the morning. And, and I'd noticed over the years on the on the videos I'd watched, as well as being at the convention, they would have lots of uh, flags on the stage. Mm -hmm. They'd have flags of all the participating countries in the convention, which is a huge number of countries uh, that have Toastmasters clubs. So it was, yeah, it was almost like a United Nations of speaking. So we <laughs> loads and loads of very, very bright, colourful background. And without even thinking about it, a classic male thing to do. I thought, well, I'll just wear the normal sort of dark suit, you know, white shirt and so on. And uh, in Vancouver, it was a bit different. And, and I only really clocked this afterwards when I watched the video, the film of the final. It was done in the evening. For, and secondly, it was done, there were no flags. And it was done with a black backdrop. It was an enormous black curtain. And, and it looked pretty... You know, pretty. Uh, it looked pretty serious, to be honest. It's a bit funeral esque. Uh, ironically, <laughs> one of the other speakers in the final, John Andrew, gave a talk which, based on his experience as an undertaker, uh, which <laughs> kind of fit quite well, I think, with the rather somber background. Anyway, so when I looked at, watched it back, I just thought, oh, if only I'd worn a you know white suit or something, it was. Uh, it would have lit things up a bit. But it was a. It was a real lesson for me of. Of, of you know, every detail matters. And I'm not saying it in any way affected people's performance or, or how I did, but just as a, as a viewer, I thought, oh, I would rethink actually how, how I dressed for that, um, given what I saw on screen. Right, that's, that's amazing because if you are trying to be a world champion, if you are at the world stage representing top 10 best speakers in the world, you have to know every detail, every minute details matter. And, oh, and just yeah, and your story reminds me of uh, Aaron Beverly, who wore an Indian uh, suit, which was amazing because now that was something innovative, never done before, and probably that helped him <laughs> win the World yes, Championship. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's really striking. Just these little things make a big difference, and uh, as does something as as seemingly small uh, as just the speech title, for mm. example, can make a real make. A, that was another thing I learned actually from the from the you know, from the, the the contest experience. I had a good title for my well, was a title I was happy with at least for the semi final, the uh, which was to be perfectly honest. That was the title of the speech. But for the world final, you have to give a different speech in the final from what you give in the semi-final. So every right. speaker is giving. And, and of course, <laughs> you know, what people will typically do is put their best speeches into the semi because you've got to be in it to, uh, mm -hmm. to win it, mm -hmm. if you like. Um, but I, I just didn't give enough thought, really, to coming up with a, with a strong title for my speech. And I think it's one of those, just, it's just one of many things that can make a difference. I have to say, by the way, hands down, one of the best and certainly entertaining speech titles I've ever heard was... Um, put together by Cole McInnes, a friend of mine, mm -hmm. a member of, um, of, of Cardinals Toastmasters Club for, for a number of years. And he won the humorous competition for Britain and mm -hmm. Ireland back in 2007 with a speech entitled, uh, statistically, 100% of divorces started with marriage. <laughs> <laughs> he got laughter that's before amazing. he even took the stage. It was stunning. It was, and it's a brilliant speech yeah, as well. That's brilliant, yeah. And of course, I, I suppose it's also in my mind because Aaron Beverly, of course, famously had yeah, a very, yeah, very unusual speech title, didn't he? Which you might like to play back to us, actually, Haritosh. <laughs> yeah, that's like 50 words, words or something. It, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's amazing. So let's get into a little bit of serious because we had so much fun together, but the reason I've asked you that because uh, I want my audience to learn something from you. So let, let's get into something of important, which is uh, over the years, you have coached so many people, mentored so many people. What has been the classical mistakes that people do? One, of, one or two classical mistakes that novice presenters, who, somebody who's starting this public speaking thing that they do? Hmm. I, I think for 
for speakers, especially if they are at, at the less experienced end of the spectrum, maybe they're feeling a bit nervous, they're maybe early in their career and so on, hands down, the classic, this is so, so much a mistake, but but hurdles to overcome is this, that speaking is about the audience, it's not about the speaker. Mm. And, and, and quite understandably, especially as I say, early in one's speaking career, whether it's just as part of one's job or it's, it's I don't necessarily mean as a professional speaker, it's okay. easy to end up worrying more about the speaker. Am I going to get this right? Am I going to look good? Am I going to remember <laughs> this? Have I got it? And there's all these things which are more interesting and relevant for the speaker than for the audience. And in the end, it is all about the audience, which I know people listening to this may well have heard before, but it's just so, so important. And I find myself continually having to to relearn that lesson and it's like fitness it takes constant reinforcement to think right in the end what's what matters here it's actually the needs and interests of the audience at least if you're wanting to be a value to that audience so i think that's 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 one i think a second for speakers that are much more experienced and perhaps have have got that idea they know that it's about the audience and they're 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 comfortable they've got lots of hours under their belt on stage Mm -hmm. i'd say the the particularly thinking about my work in in the workplace the the biggest challenge or, or hurdle is is to is to actually drive change as a result of what one's mm. saying in other words it's easy for people to just get sucked into i'm going to say this this and this here are my key points this is what i need to cover this is that and they prepare stuff and it may be perfectly good stuff uh it, it might even be true <laughs> but <laughs> but if it doesn't trigger meaningful change really engage and shift the way mm-hmm. in which people in the audience are thinking and feeling and behaving, then it's a complete waste of time. And and I think professionally speaking, by which I mean small p, small s, professionally speaking, that's a, that's a classic because of it, no change in the workplace. And I've worked with very, very senior leaders for whom that's been their key challenge. It's been, <clears throat> yeah, I can speak, I can put stuff together, I know my stuff and don't know, but I, I, I'm not getting the results that I need yet, or I'm not getting results in the way that I want yet. I need to really right. win hearts and minds. How do I do that? And, and so that's that's why it's such an important challenge, I think, especially for people in leadership roles. Amazing, amazing. Love both of the things that you mentioned. Uh, it's not about you, it's about the audience. And are you able to make the change versus just putting it out there? Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the other aspects in public speaking is, which is now the buzzword all over the world, is storytelling. So I want to l- know your perspective of what do you think about storytelling uh, in business, in, in general speaking, and also what are some of the tips that people can start using right away? Uh, one or two tips that you want to give to the audience. Well, well I love Brené Brown's comment. And if you haven't seen uh, listeners, if you, uh, you're listening to this and you haven't seen Brené's brand, The Power of Vulnerability, TEDx mm-hmm. Talk, the very famous TEDx Talk that uh, put her on the map beyond the worlds of academia, I think it's fair to say. I, I love her description of storytelling. She calls it data with a soul, mm-hmm. which I think is a lovely way to think about it because um, what it suggests is that it's complementary to rational evidence, a good story. It brings things to life. It's emotive. It's evocative. And and as you say, Haritosh, you know, it, it's become very in vogue in recent years, pa- pa- partly inspired, I think, by the impact of, of TED. And some people say, oh, yes, it's a there's a story. So it must be a TED talk as if somehow <laughs> storytelling is a TED thing. <laughs> the reality, of course, is that storytelling as a technique for a spoken communication is as old as the hills. You know, Abraham mm-hmm. Lincoln uh, wrote about this extensive the importance of storytelling in his upbringing, for example, Lyndon right. Johnson as well. And um, so it's uh, yeah, it's just that Ted has, has latched onto that, recognized that um, okay. I, I, storytelling is so powerful. And I think um, it's it's relevant for for the the, the, the the tale one tells of one's organization, of one's Correct. life, professional value. Um, and as that, I, I suppose one of the things that comes to my mind is that tip from Bill Gove, the uh, one of the leading lights of the professional speaking world in the United States in the 20th century, who said when asked for his top tip on public speaking, said, make a point, tell a story or tell a mm-hmm. story to make mm-hmm. a point. And it's it's just gold. And yet I still meet all sorts of folk in the professional world, whether it's in financial services or technology or in engineering or in entrepreneurship, who um Yes, struggle to, to 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 recognize the value of stories, and sometimes also, and certainly, they will struggle to then bring those stories to life in the most compelling way possible. Absolutely, I I love that perspective. Uh, 
I see a lot of people actually struggle when they are talking about story. They think that the story has to be big, sensational and something more. I had a couple of stories since mo- this morning. Uh, and I, I thought maybe I can share that. Now, my, my daughter, which wakes up every day, she had to be woken up because she needs to go to school. Hmm. Woke up today because she had some dress up to be done and she's going to become the mighty girl. And and we saw that and it was like, what a transformation. Because when you have some excitement inside, you do things that you don't normally do. And that that was like first story. And the second story since this morning is that I, I got a chance to sit in Tesla for the very first time. Which I have. Oh never wow! Seen. Nice. I, I got. I booked the cap because I was good late for the high school. So I booked the cap and I got a Tesla. And I was like, "Wow, this must be a story." So it doesn't <laughs> have to be that big thing that you go to mountain with your le- one of the legs cut down. It it has to be this simple, practical, and daily life thing that can also become really inspirational stories as well. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. I, I think it was Lance Miller, the 2005 world champion, who said, uh, find the extraordinary in the ordinary. Right. And I think that is so true. A stand up comedians are a brilliant case study for this, by the way. Absolutely. When you look at certainly here in the UK and again, listeners may be familiar with Michael McIntyre, for example, who's become hugely successful, not just in the UK, but also internationally mm-hmm. as well. And mm-hmm. And as a comedian, he draws on very, very everyday stuff. I mean, you're know, getting dressed, getting the children out the house, you know, <laughs> and, and, and he, he just has that ability to or that that skill, actually, I should say, um, of of really noticing in life what's going on. And you're, you're so right. Harris. There are things going on every day that we can that we can draw on and use. And the and it's a mistake to think that it has to be some big drama, sometimes the most compelling insights can come from very everyday experiences i think of uh, is it prezian who won the the championship I, again i mentioned the championship a lot just because it's in my mind given the, the setup right, for this conversation right. but but he won the championship some years ago with a speech uh, on changing like, a, yeah, he was changing right. a car tire right i remember that speech yeah i think it's 2012 he won the world championship sounds right yeah 2012 yeah absolutely and, it, and i think it's it's I think it's uh, it's very inspiring to, to remind oneself as, of that because so, because here's what I found over the years with people, say with executives, whether it's C-suite or entrepreneurs, um, refugees, MBAs, academics, all sorts. Here's what we do as, as human beings, I've found, myself included, we consistently underestimate the true value of our own personal experience. We, 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 we take it for granted and we, we, we forget what it's like to not have had that experience. And and even if we do recognize that we've had the experience, people often think, well, no one will be interested in that. That's boring. My, I've, I've worked with school children, for example, have literally flat said to me, so my life's boring. Mm. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. And the story of one particular girl who literally was doing that, no, it isn't, came up with a speech and a story that I then used in my talk at TEDx London on Royal Festival Hall, you know, and she started out thinking that. Her life's boring. We, there is gold in our experience, but we have to go digging for it. Absolutely love it. I think the art, that is why it's called an art, because you have to have that skill to actually bring those stories and bring the insight and then put it in your presentation. The girl whose life was boring actually became part of this conversation. She might not be even aware. <laughs> Almost certainly not. <laughs> right. and, and certainly if I think about the the stories that I've used um, certainly any stories that predate uh, mm-hmm. 2008, which is when I, f- that's when I left my job two weeks before Lehman's went bust in GFC. <laughs> it was an interesting time to go independent as a speaker and uh, coach. But any <laughs> story, know. any experience that I'd had before certainly 2008, at the time I had that experience, I never would have thought I would ever use in a speech. Um, yeah, including the leaving drinks and the, the phone call that I mentioned earlier for my first job in headhunting. When those experiences happened, I was not thinking, Do you know, I might use those in a in a in a conversation <laughs> online on LinkedIn Live and Facebook Live, you know, 20, 25 or 20, 20 plus years later. Never even right. occurred to me. But we can get ahead of the game by by noting this, uh, these, these things proactively. Absolutely. So do you recommend having a story bank or story file? I think so. I, th- I think it's great to do that. Absolutely. Um, I, I, well, as an example, actually, no. well, there's a version of mine. Cool. <laughs> now, I can see that. Yeah. A3, there's five boxes on each. Each box is a different. I've given them just a series of, of headings. One is, for example, what have we got here? So here, um, this is early years. 
and mm-hmm. each load is a bullet point with a different story. So we've got RRA, risk of scripting, Toastmasters, speaking without notes, Jonathan Lee's advice. Yeah, it's literally mm-hmm. just a phrase to remind me of the story. Um, right. And I think it's it's just so valuable. I mean, I'm not saying every, absolutely everything religiously has to be captured. I've got some things on a desktop Word file as well. But I think getting into the habit of, of noticing um, David Jones, a fellow Toastmaster and uh, a friend, um, very, very, very uh, skilled and effective impromptu speaker in particular, uh, and also has experience as a semi professional stand up comedian. He ran a, 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 some night classes, which I attended some years ago on stand up comedy. And I remember him saying the difference between an average comedian and an outstanding comedian is a notebook and a pen. Mm. Uh, I think the same could be said of speakers. It's that it's that getting into that habit of of noticing not just stories, of course, but insights, ideas. I find myself tapping into my phone and sending myself an email. Often if I'm out and about, for example, I, I certainly don't go on the bus carrying that with me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but but absolutely. absolutely so that you you start to just get into the habit of of logging things and it, it it's Absolutely. it's extraordinary how much you can you can j- capture just by paying attention but it does need truly, to be long because otherwise chances are it'll get forgotten truly truly and and the reason i remember the story from the morning is i put it on my phone and texted myself because i was like this is great but i'm probably gonna forget in two hours so i need to do that and and on the point of the story bag i just finished this book story worthy by matthew dicks amazing amazing sto- book on stories and he says, I'm giving you an assignment for life that every night when you go to bed, take out five minutes and write down the stories of the day because you will forget mm-hmm. tomorrow what has happened today. Uh, but if you note it down, you will remember every time you refer and yes. you'll get some brilliant story. I love oh, that. Insight. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. I, I, I mentioned, mentioned earlier that the speech that um, that I developed uh, that got me to into the world final in Vancouver mm-hmm. in 2017, to be perfectly honest, was the title. The message of the speech was, to be perfectly honest, you don't have to be perfect. You just mm-hmm. have to be honest. Right. And, and it's a, a quite fun little play on words. But and, and, and that speech was developed over six months. Everything about the speech changed apart from the core message and title. And then Mm -hmm. one of the stories in the speech, but it went through a lot of change over that six months. I'd been thinking about honesty and that whole theme of of being honest but with other people or with yourself, literally honest or what, for a long, long time. And I couldn't figure out a way to make it work because I thought I don't want to stand up and say you've got to tell the truth because, of course, we don't. (laughs) We we lie all the time, often with very good intentions. But it took... A long time for me to realize that actually this was about self-honesty, being honest with yourself. Mm-hmm. And I thought, yeah, yeah, you don't have to be perfect. The idea for that line came to me. I was on a treadmill in a gym. Here's the point. I was literally working. This is pre-COVID, you can tell. I, I was on a treadmill and I was running away thinking about this stuff. And I had to stop the treadmill, get off and then write in. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be honest. Wow. And, and log it because otherwise I thought I'll forget. I'll forget. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I, I can so much relate with the trade wheel because every day I go and I have this noise cancellation. I'll be listening to some podcasts. I'm like, this is amazing. I, I need to note it down. So I'll be sending text or note it down somewhere because pretty sure after five minutes, I'm going to forget that. And I might not get that for next few days or might not get it ever back. So love yes. it. Love it. Yes. Yes. So, it's also, um, it's fun. I think it's, it's entirely aside from speech craft. I think it's just a lovely thing to do to, I, to log things, to notice things in one's life. I think uh, was it Tony Robbins that said, if a life's worth living, it's worth recording. Uh, <laughs> and he wasn't talking about speech development. He was just talking about noticing um, yeah, how, how, how much we gain, how much we learn, f- both good things and not so good things, of course. It's a bit like when climbing a mountain, I'm a very keen hill walker and you know, you plot away and and every single step might feel quite tough, especially if it's steep. But mm-hmm. then after you've done that for a few hours, you look back and you think, ah, goodness me, I've come a long way. And it feels That's a little true. bit like that, you know, when we reflect on all these things that we've got. Was it Michael Palin, the um, the former Monty Python and then big, big uh, mm-hmm. television presenter for travel programs, which I've loved. By the way, if you haven't seen his Michael mm-hmm. Palin travel programs around the world, I highly recommend them. But he has... There was a program recently where they interviewed him to reflect on all of these journeys he's done all over the world, around the world in 80 days from pole to pole and so on. 
and and he he said i'm going to get get some of my journals out which i haven't opened for a long time and they showed his shelf and it was just wall to wall of journals of just notes he'd taken i mean I'm, i'm nothing like as disciplined as that but i thought wow that must be an amazing thing to have done and to be able to look back on uh, imagine the richness of material he's got there amazing love that love that amazing so that actually leads so i know it, i'm really loving this whole conversation really getting so many insight and i know you have a limited time so let's get towards probably the last or maybe the second last question uh, you also mentioned earlier you are a public speaking expert you are a public speaking coach and uh, what do you think is the importance of coaching and mentoring in general and also specifically in public speaking well uh, i'm reminded of a comment by i think it was w mitchell inspirational speaker who who referenced tiger woods and when he said this it was at the time that tiger woods was absolutely at the top of his mm-hmm. um success as a golfer and he was just winning everything in sight it was a few years ago now and he simply said w mitchell simply said tiger woods has a coach is there anyone mm-hmm. in this room who doesn't need a coach <laughs> <laughs> and that was to an audience of professional speakers so i think that, that, that partly that i i think we all live in our own goldfish bowl in a sense in that right. it's impossible for us to see ourselves as others do we we just can't by definition i can't see a speech in the same way that someone else can uh, i do my best but i can never actually really get that because i'm in my mm-hmm. own head um and, and that's true of any other any number of other aspects of one's life so of course what a good coach will bring is is a fresh view an external perspective and so on as well as one hopes especially if if it is um if it is functionally specific coaching like speaking people uh, an individual who has really uh, had meaningful experience in that in that field and 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 so what i've found over the years especially when i'm working with folk in the in the working world and and particularly if they are at a very senior level is they'll say well yeah, actually i really want you to give me some advice just give me some direction do I, yeah because I, i know there is a school of of thought in coaching that says oh, i should always be enabling it should always be you know questioning help the client get to the answer themselves and 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 obviously there's tremendous value in that but mm-hmm. that is only one tool in the toolbox i think i know for sure there are times when a client has looked me in the eye and they said look just what what's your best advice based on your experience and you can give people a really really compelling shortcut true so i think uh, in in those sorts of ways i think coaching can be hugely valuable and and i've certainly benefited hugely from from individuals who have coached me mentored me over uh, over sometimes very short compressed periods of time and sometimes over much longer periods of time it's been formative absolutely. formative totally go what you said i mean like you whatever i've done i think coaches mentors have been a great help a great source of inspiration for all of us so thank you so much simon it was amazing amazing listening to you and learning so many inside i i don't know how you remember all these quotes that's another talent we need to learn from you uh, and i wish i can get something from, from you on that uh who who are the people you're looking forward to work with and how you know how can they approach you how can they reach you yeah well i the, 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 one of the biggest joys of my work is that i continue to work with a very very broad range of people uh, first of all it's not i i do work with people in corporate life i work with entrepreneurs i've got um working with a couple of best men right now for weddings uh, so it, it all sorts and i love that. i'm going to a school up in leicestershire in a, in 2 or 3 weeks time and so on so that's so that's the first thing and and it's a lot of my work is one to one if people are interested then two two ways in which to uh connect one is through my website simonbucknell.com and mm-hmm. on there the contact form can reach me and there's various um you know pieces of, uh, of of information there in terms of different options for how we could work together if that's something that's of interest alternatively uh, linkedin i'm i'm active on linkedin as you mentioned earlier heritos right so do yeah connect with me follow or follow me on linkedin because i am posting at the moment i am posting daily literally daily i made that commitment in the 1st of january this year and i'm really enjoying that process because it's forcing me to notice what i'm thinking each day and to post something and that's a short article or a short video so find me on linkedin would love to connect with you there Thank you so much Simon so please follow Simon on LinkedIn as he already said I've been really really enjoying his post and insights and learning and I had a lot more question but I know you have limited time I have limited time so maybe for next time but thank you so much once again and 
as i say every time to all the audience keep learning keep growing and keep going out of your comfort zone this is haritosh and i hope to see you in another in- interview in future take care and have a great week ahead <laughs>